So we were studying internal flow, convection heat transfer by internal flow and as I told you before and you might have already uh, seen this now in this course throughout the formulas are there, empirical formulas are there and tons and tons of formulas are there. What you need to do is just you need to focus on uh, how to use these formulas, when to use these formulas, that's it. So if you know what is the condition, when to, which formula to use, under what condition we have to use that formula, that's it. This is all about this course now. now. And so uh, we were talking about internal flows last time and we discussed about uh, the hydrodynamic condition considerations where the velocity layer, what velocity boundary layer is developed as the flow enters the pipe. Then we also discussed about the thermal considerations if the pipe temperature is different from the fluid temperature then there is a thermal boundary layer which will be developed. Okay. Then you will, we discussed about the entry length, so there is a region in which the profile is being developed. So that is the entry region and once it is fully developed then you have the fully developed region. Okay. Then after that we started, uh, we also discussed about uh, Moody chart okay. and we discussed how to determine the pressure, uh, pressure difference across the pipe through which the fluid is flowing. And uh, then we went on to discussing about uh, determination of mean temperature of the fluid as it flows through the pipe for two conditions. One, if the pipe has a constant heat flux. So if the pipe has constant heat flux, so you remember we came up that, okay, this will be the formula for a constant heat flux. So this will be the formula of the mean temperature whatever be the distance fluid has traveled inside the pipe. So the mean temperature at that distance will be this. Okay. And then after that uh, we had, uh, we discussed about the other case, not the constant heat flux, the other one is a constant surface temperature. If we have a constant surface temperature, then we end up with this formula. <coughs> okay. So T mean outlet is equals to T surface minus T surface minus T mean inlet exponential negative HAS upon M dot CP and we said that HAS upon MCP is known as NTU, NTU which is number of transfer units and even in the, in, in the calculator if you put exponent negative 5, if NTU is 5, so you will find that the answer is, you can check. So in the end what will happen is that your TS is approximately equals to TMO. So this answer will be very, very close to zero. Okay. So if, if it is very close to zero, Ts becomes equals to Tmo. Okay. So Tmo means T mean outlet. So it becomes the condition where the T mean outlet becomes very close to T surface, almost equal, 0.1 percent difference. So we talked about this case. And the next slide that we are going to discuss is just a continuation of this case. Now in this case, this is the formula, right? This is the main formula that we came up with. And uh, obviously this formula originated from here. So what we are discussing is uh, the convective heat transfer from the pipe surface to the fluid. Convective heat transfer from the pipe surface to the fluid. So in this case, there is only one resistance, which is the convective resistance through for which you, you use H, right? So suppose it, it is not from T surface, okay? So your, your pipe is this, okay? Yeah. And this is, this is T surface, okay? And inside you have the fluid and this is Tm, T mean inside, right? So suppose, uh, so from, from the surface to the fluid, there is one resistance only, which is a convective resistance. So suppose we don't know the T surface of the inside, we know the T surface of the outside. So pipe has certain thickness and let's say this is TSI, we don't know that, we know TSO, outer surface temperature. So if this is the case, then from T surface O to TM, Okay, T surface O to Tm. Now, 
our, we will have now a combination of two resistances. So we will have a conductive resistance within the pipe and then the convective resistance. Right? Suppose we don't know TSO. There is another fluid flowing, a different fluid flowing outside. And we know the T infinity of that fluid. Then we have a convective resistance from that fluid to the pipe. Then conductive resistance within the pipe uh, thickness. Then convective resistance here. So in any case, we will have a combination of resistances, right? So instead of having, is, suppose if it is not TS, if it is T infinity, then instead of having H here, you will have U here. U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. Remember the concept of overall heat transfer coefficient? If you have more than one connected in series, or there is a series parallel combination, whatever. So overall heat transfer coefficient is represented by U. So it becomes the same formula, but depends upon what temperatures you are using here. Is it TS? Is it TS outside? Is it T infinity outside? So the formula becomes this. This is the same formula, only the difference is that replace TS by T infinity. T infinity is the temperature outside. Okay, And then in this case, instead of having H, you have U. And finding U is simple. Okay, so, so you have to solve the series circuit. Okay. Anyways, so now we move towards the formula section, which is the most important section. In this chapter, these, this, this slide is actually was very much compacted. I have uh, placed it in three different slides. And within the next slides, okay, one, two, sorry, two different slides. So that's, this will be present in the book of formulas and it's related to all the formulas that we'll be using for different cases inside, uh, flow inside a pipe. Now these are the convective correlations for flow in a circular tube. Make sure this is only for <coughs> circular tubes. If the tube is not circular, then these relations are not valid for it. Okay. Now you do understand the laminar flow and the turbulent flow in case of the internal flows. Yes. What is the condition for laminar flow? The Reynolds number should be less than what? Two thousand three hundred for internal flows. Two into ten to the power was external flow. In internal flow. The, it 2300. If the Reynolds number is less than 2300, laminar flow. And what was the condition for the turbulent flow? Is there anything that you don't understand? Ref. Huh. Is there anything you don't understand? No. Oh, I thought. Uh, I asked about the chapter 5. I remember something. Okay. Mm, so, uh, if if the Reynolds number is greater than 10,000, then it is turbulent flow for the internal flows. It is all written in the previous slides. Okay. Now, we have two different kind of problems if it is laminar flow. As you know, we have to take into consideration whether the flow is in the entry, in entry region or it is fully developed. Okay. So, for the entry region problem, we can have two different categories if it is a thermal entry <coughs> region or if it is a combined entry region. First of all, you need to understand the difference between the two cases. So suppose you have an open pipe here. Open pipe means the pipe is starting from here. It is open. Okay. And the flow is entering into the pipe. So the velocity boundary layer will start developing and if the temperature of the pipe is different than the free stream yeah, temperature yeah, yeah. then the thermal boundary layer both will start developing at the same time so both will be developing at the same time if this is the case then it is the combined entry length but suppose you have a pipe which is starting from this end to this end and the flow is continuously moving so basically flow enters into the pipe when it is already fully developed okay but then once it reaches to certain point, you start heating it. So, so the thermal boundary layer will start developing at the point when you start heating it. Okay. So if this is the case, when the, when the flow is already there, 
So the velocity profile is already developed. Only the thing that starts developing later is the thermal profile when you start heating it. Okay. So if this is the case, then this is this case is known as thermal entry region problem. The definition of the two are important in the sense that you should know what is the difference between the thermal entry region and the combined entry region. So let me repeat again. In thermal entry region problem, velocity profile is already developed. The only thing which is developing is the thermal profile. In the combined boundary, in the combined entry region, neither the velocity profile is developed nor the thermal profile is developed. Both. What do you mean by developed? Did you take the last class? Yes. Yeah. So you remember that uh, uh, the when, once once the flow enters, the boundary layer starts developing in a time reach when the boundary layer is fully developed. So this is the entry region when it is developing. Okay. That was about it. Okay. Similarly, for the case of velocity profile, hydrodynamic consideration. This was thermal, hydrodynamic. So velocity profile is developing, developing, developing. A time is reached when the velocity profile is fully developed. Okay. Remember? So if if velocity profile and the thermal profile both start developing at the same time, both start developing at the same time, then this kind of problem is combined entry length. If Velocity profile is already developed, but thermal profile is start to develop later, then it is a thermal entry end problem. Okay. Why do you need to know this? Because for two different cases, you will have two different formulas. Okay, so now let's now you need to focus here over the formulas. If it is laminar fully developed, then the formula for F friction factor is 64 upon Renault number. If it is laminar fully developed but uniform heat flux, then the formula for Nusselt number is 4.36. Remember, Nusselt number, this is the local Nusselt number. Whenever it is average, a bar is there. Okay. If it is laminar, fully developed, but uniform surface temperature, then the formula for Nusselt number is this. If laminar, thermal entry problem. So you know what is thermal entry problem. If laminar, thermal entry problem, or combined entry, both are possible, but for combined entry, Prandtl number should be greater than 5. Uniform surface temperature, then the formula is this. Now this formula uses another term which is a Gretz number. Gretz number. G-R-A-E-T-Z. And this Gretz number formula is given here. Gretz number is D by X multiplied by Reynolds number multiplied by Prandtl number. Okay. So anyways, this also depends upon Renault number and Prandtl number. Even you can put it in terms of Renault and Prandtl number without the Gretz number. Just by putting the Gretz number, it becomes a little simple. Okay. Anyways, this is the formula. If it is laminar combined entry, Prandtl number greater than 0.1, uniform surface temperature, then formula is this. Now I want you to focus about upon these three formulas and tell me what are the differences. Yeah. Because this is the thing where you will feel trouble. In the exam you will have a problem and you know if I want to play with the problem I can play in many ways. Okay, So I can make the condition such that you use some other formula but now the condition is such that you have to use some other formula. Right? There are conditions. If the Prandtl number is this, use this. If this so, so maybe you, you solve a problem in one way and what I do is that I give the same problem in exam but change one, change one or two conditions such that the formula will be changed. Now you have to at the exam time you have to judge yourself which formula has to be used. So how would you differentiate which formula you have to use? By the description. By the description, yes. But what are what is the major thing? See, all three are for laminar. 
So this this is for fully developed, and this is not fully developed. These are in the entry region, thermal or combined entry. So you get the difference. If it is fully developed, which one? If it is not fully developed, then this. One. Now, if it is not fully developed, still you have two possibilities. Which one to use? Both have uniform surface temperature. Okay, but what's the difference? Combined entry and thermal entry. No, but this this is said that combined entry can be used here as F, well. F the problem. Yeah. So, but still, let's say I gave you a problem. Now you have to make a decision whether you use this formula or this formula. I Which one will you choose? You have to check Prandtl. So suppose the Prandtl is because this is a tricky thing here. This is a thing where you will you where, where when you will do mistake you will lose marks. That's why I'm focusing on it. Suppose Prandtl number is six. So I have to see if the surface temperature is uniform or not. Both, both have uniform. Use the second slide. Hmm? Use the second one, the first one. First one, exactly. Why? Yeah, no. Easier? Yeah, you know, sometimes what happens is that I give you two scales. One scale have reading in millimeter, other scale have reading in meters. Okay? And I ask you to measure a distance uh, which is actually 5 meter. So which scale will you use? The one with the millimeter? No, you will use the one with the meter. Although the millimeter one can also measure that. Okay? But if I give you a scale, if I give you two scales and I ask you, to, okay, find out the distance of this length, find out this length, and this length is already in millimeters. So obviously you cannot use the one which is which is giving you readings in meter. Okay? So, hmm? so if, so there are chances of error will be more. Suppose the one which has readings in meter only, so then you will guess, because your reading is actually in millimeter, but millimeter scales are not given. So then you will make a guess. And your guess might be wrong. But the steps are wrong. No. The steps are wrong here because these conditions are given. So here, point to note, if the Prandtl number is greater than five or equal to five, use this. If the Prandtl number is less than five, don't use this. Use that. Use this. If the Prandtl, if the Prandtl number is Doesn't. less than five, okay, then? If it doesn't form both of these formulas, you use the first one. If the Prandtl number is, uh, suppose, uh, uh, 7, 8, Prandtl number is 10. The first so considering that you use this and this, both should give the right answer. Because yes. both condition is satisfied. Yes. Okay? But then use, if Prandtl number is greater than 5, use this one. Okay? Don't use this. You get it? For, uh, 5.1. 5.1, use this. <laughs> Do you get it or not? Yes. This is how this is how things are given in the book, and this is how you have to see and work with it. Okay. So now, if you see here, all these were for the laminar. Now, now we start with the turbulent. If we have turbulent, then friction factor is determined by this formula, or you can use the Moody's chart. Moody's chart also uses this formula actually. Okay. And in this formula you have F, where this F can be given by this as well. But, but this is only for the case if it is fully developed, smooth walls. If the walls are smooth. So you see here in this formula there is no E by D. Relative roughness. Zero, goes to zero. Yeah. Here we have E by D, but here we don't have E by D. So this is only for the smooth walls. But if we have some roughness, then this formula. Anyways, for, for these two, it's better to use the Moody chart. Don't need to use this formula, it's better to use directly the Moody chart. Then you have, for the turbulent case, fully developed, 
Brandel number between 0.6 to 160. Renault number greater than 10,000. L by T greater than 10. N equals to 0.4 for TS greater than M, greater than TM. And N equals to 0.3 for TS less than TM. So many conditions. This is, this is why it is not just plug and play. This is why, although it is nothing so far what you have, what you have been doing from uh, last chapter where when we started external flows, what we are doing, just formulas are given, we have to apply them. But there are so many conditions you have to consider so that it is, that it does not remain just plug and play. You have to know which one you have to use. Okay? You need practice for it. If you come in the exam without practicing for these conditions, you will do mistake. You will fail. You will do mistake. You, will fail. you understand? So, these are the conditions. So, this is actually, this is one of the most common for formulas which you will be using even in the course of heat exchanger design. When you go to the next year and you will ha have a course of heat exchanger design, this is one of the most common formula which you will be using. And anybody who knows a little about heat exchanger design, they know this formula, dittus boiter formula. This is known as dittus boiter formula. So dittus boiter formula is one of the most used formula because this is for the turbulent flows. And most of the time, we make the case of turbulent flow. So we have the heat exchanger, we want turbulent flow inside because turbulent flow allows larger heat transfer. As you remember, I gave you one time an example. If you want quickly to mix something, you, you shake it. Shake it means you make turbulence in it. Turbulence make quick heat transfer, quick mass transfer. These things happen quickly in turbulent flows. So most of the time heat exchangers are designed for turbulent flows. And whenever you have turbulent flows, dittus boiter formula is one of the most common formula which is used. Okay. Then you have another formula here. Can you tell me what is the difference between the two formulas? Which one to use when? Read the description. Turbulent, fully, fully developed. developed. the number between 0 0.7 and 16,000. Okay, tell me, if the Prandtl number is uh, 140, which formula will you use? This one. This one. Then must use the first one. If you use the second one, wrong. One. Hmm? Although it's in the range, but the first one gives you a better approximation in the range. If I say you Prandtl so number 140. You use the second one if the Prandtl number is more than 160. Yes. So Prandtl number, if I say Prandtl number 140, if the Prandtl number is 140, 140 is within this range, also within this range. So you are right to say that we can use anyone. But no, if, because I, as I told you, these, uh, these formulas are approximations. These formulas are approximations and there will be error even when you make calculation. So if you use this one for 140 Brandel number, the chances of error are less. If you use this one, the chances of error are much higher. Yeah, because, yeah. because we are covering a large range. You get, you, are you getting the idea? Yes. So, so if the Prandtl number is uh, 250, so then it is very clear. 250, then second one. Hmm? Okay. Now let's talk about the third formula. We have another third formula. Okay, so what's the difference? Turbulent? Above 160, above 1600, above two, less than 2000. But there is another pro two thousand, yes. But there is another thing. Check the Renault number. No, no. 3, to 5 into 10 to the power 6. Renault number greater than 10,000. 10, Renault number greater than 10,000. Suppose I gave you a problem where the Renault number is 6000. Which one we formula will you use? Suppose I give you a case in which the Renault number is 6000. 
How will you use second one? Six thousand. This is only for Renault number greater than ten thousand. So you have to see Renault number and Toronto number both to decide which formula you have to use. It is really, I'm telling you once again, it is really not as easy as it looks like. Yes. Because you have you have to consider all the all the factors. So we have to find Renault number and yeah. Okay, these two are the cases. The next two, the next two are the cases which we are not covering right now. In this chapter, we have left these topics for the liquid metals. Okay. But anyways, if you want to cover these cases, are for those. But we discussed so many. Uh, students please focus we discussed so many things but there is still one thing which we which is left for discussion you are going to find out Renault number and Prandtl number based on that you are going to determine which formula you have to use but do you remember that Renault number has is VD upon mu and for finding mu you need to know the temperature and do you know that which temperature you have to use to find out mu these are the set of conditions written here So, properties in equation 8.53, 8.55, 8.6, 8.61, 8.62, 8.64, 8.65 8 are based on Tm. T mean temperature. Only these set of equations. Only these set of equations. These equations are written here. Okay. Properties in equation 8.19, 8.20, and 8.21 are based on Tf. If you use Tm instead of Tf, it will be wrong. Tf is T surface plus T mean divided by 2. Tf for what? Mean film temperature. So you have a pipe, you have a mean inlet temperature, mean outlet temperature, you have the surface temperature. So when you are finding the properties, you have to consider you have you are finding properties at what temperature? So determine the equation first and then what temperature? Yes. Okay, let's move towards the problem solution. It is much better than discussing in air. A system for heating water from an inlet temperature of T mean inlet equals to 20 degrees centigrade to an outlet temperature of T mean outlet equals to 60 degrees centigrade involves passing the water through a thick wall tube having inner and outer diameter of 20 and 40 millimeter. So you have a tube and inside the tube uh, you have in, inside the tube you have water flowing and the water is actually heated water is being heated okay the tube is thick walled whenever we say it is thick walled means there will be an outer radius there will be an inner radius there will be an outer diameter there will be an inner diameter okay and it is given inner and outer diameters are 20 and 40 millimeter the outer surface of the tube is well insulated so what happened is that at the outer surface there is a perfect insulation and electrical heating within the walls provide for a uniform generation rate of 10 to the power 6 watt per meter cube. So the thing is that so you have a tube this is the tube which is used for water heating okay this is the tube which is used for water heating water is entering into the tube so that's the inlet this is you can say the outlet okay outside is well insulated inside the tube you have electrical heating so the electrical heater heats the tube the heat is being transferred convectively from the tube to the water right inlet temperature mean inlet temperature is 20 degrees centigrade 
So here, Ti, Tmi is known, right? And to an outlet temperature, T mean outlet is also known. So T mean outlet is known, right? Thick wall tube. Inner diameter is known. Outer, outer diameter is known, right? The outer surface of the tube is well insulated. Outer surface is well insulated. And electrical heating within the walls provide for a uniform generation rate of, so look at the unit. The generation rate is given in 10 is to be power 6 watt, watt per meter cube. Watt per meter cube of what? Of yeah, it's, so, the so it's the volume of the wall, volume, volume of the tube actually. So heat is being generated inside the tube by the electrical heater. And how much heat is generated? Based upon the volume of the tube, okay? The tube material. So it is 6, 10 to the power 6 watt per meter cube. For a, for a water mass flow rate, mass flow rate of the water is given, m dot, is 0.1 kg per second. How long must the tube be? So we need to find what is what should be the length of this tube. How long must the tube be to achieve a desired outlet temperature? So this is the outlet temperature. This is the desired outlet temperature. We need to know how much should be this length so that actually this temperature is reached. Is it clear? Yes. First of all, do you understand the problem statement or not? Do you understand the problem statement or not? No. What What is the thing that you do not understand? Don't worry about it. Ask. We have a tube, pipe. Yeah. There is a water inside it. Mm -hmm. And there is a different, grade, a different temperature. Water obviously is entering from here at some temperature. And as water passes through the pipe, it will gain heat. What because he wants, what he wants. You want to know what should be the length of the pipe so that the outlet temperature is, if the inlet temperature is how much, 20 degree? If we want the outlet temperature of the water to be 60 degree, what should be the length of the pipe? <laughs> Cannot say like this. Do you understand the problem statement now or not? Yes. So the heat generated, electrical heat generated in the pipe since it is insulated outside, cannot go, cannot escape out. So Whatever the heat generated will go to the water. Okay? But we need to know what should be the length of the pipe so that the temperature of water becomes 60 degree at the outlet. Do you understand the problem statement now or not? Yes. Zarani. Yes, yes, complete. You understand it or not? Inshallah. <laughs> If there is anything you don't understand, ask. Because later when we move forward, then things will become difficult for me to go back. It's fine? Oh, you did not read the question, huh? What? You did not read the question? No, you didn't. Okay. Anyways. Now, how can we solve the problem? This problem is solved by the energy balance. Energy balance is simple. How much energy generated is equals to the amount of energy convected, which is equals to the amount of energy gained by the water. Energy generated is equals to the amount of energy convected, which is equals to the amount of energy gained by water. Do you understand this energy balance? Yes. Three energies, they are all same. Energy generated is equal to the amount of energy convected because proper insulation outside, the energy can only go by, by convection. So, it's, so it's, it cannot go outside, it cannot escape. So energy generated is equal to the amount of energy convected, which is equal to the amount of energy gained by water. Okay. So let's first talk about the energy generation. How much is the energy generation? No, I need the actual amount of energy generation in watts. In what? In watt. Volume. volume. So what is the volume? 
So Q will be equals to, I will say Q dot multiply by the volume, right? So what is the volume? Okay, tell me in terms of the variables, what is the volume? Uh, by R square, L. Uh, we use the, the area of the two, two circles. By the end. By? Yes, yes. Uh, we can use the area. Multiply the length. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's minus Perfect, perfect, perfect. So, volume is what? If I see the cross section, the cross section of the tube is like this. So, this is my tube, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the area is pi d naught square minus d i square by four. We want the inner one, right? We, know, we need the volume yeah, of like multiply by so this is the cross section if you multiply it by L so that's the volume so Q dot pi by 4 D naught square minus D I square by L do you understand it or not yes do you understand the formula yes so this is energy generation but Actually, we don't know the length, okay? Now, energy generation is equals to energy convected, which is equals to energy gained by water, right? So let's talk about energy gained by water. What is energy gained by water? Energy gained by water is Q equals to M dot Cp delta T, right? Yes. Energy gained by water is M dot Cp delta t okay now delta t will be what t mean outlet minus t mean inlet do we know t mean outlet yes do we know t mean inlet yes we know mass flow rate yes and cp we can find yes. at the t mean not inlet not outlet average mm -hmm. cp here average and because since we know what is inlet what is outlet so we can find out what is the t mean average and based on T mean average, you will find what is CP. CP. Okay? So now do we know Q? Yes. So if we know Q, can we find L? Yes. That's it. Do you understand? So first problem is for solve. Part one is solved. Do you understand the solution of the problem or not? We find the Q and then the substitute in this equation and we have a Yeah, but why we are doing it? Do you understand that? That's the energy balance. The amount of energy generated is equal to the amount of energy gained. Mm -hmm. last last yes, lecture. last lecture, exactly. Anybody has any question? Anything that you don't understand, please ask. Don't hesitate. The energy balance is Q not by V or Q dot by volume. By yeah. Why, why, why volume? Because it is given in terms of the per unit volume. So you have to multiply by the volume to get the energy in what? So now we find Q. So we find Q here. Once we know Q, you can find L. Right? That was the thing required. What should be the length? Yes. Do you understand it or not? Uh, Zarani? Yes. Hamdi? Ghaif? Yes, yes. I have one question. Yes. Uh, here, uh, Q convection equal to Q generation, right? I did is Q generation equals to energy raised, energy gained by the by, by, by the water. Q convection is what? Q convection will be H A, H -A delta T. Okay. I did not use this right now. But anyways, because oh, since, uh, since, since here T mean inlet and outlet were given, it was possible to get Q easily from here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't need to use this one right now. Is it clear? But anyways, these three Qs will be same. Okay, so the first part is done. Let's move towards the second part. If the inner surface temperature of the tube is 70 degree, 
एट द आउटलेट वट इज द लोकल कन्वेक्टिव हीट ट्रांसफर कोफिशेंट एट द आउटलेट फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड द प्रॉब्लम स्टेटमेंट इफ द इनर सरफेस टेम्परेचर ऑफ द ट्यूब इज सेवेंटी डिग्री सो वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट इनर सर्फेस टेम्परेचर इन साइड सेवेंटी डिग्री एट द आउटलेट For both sides, right? So just here. And down. Mm, yes, around the complete periphery at the outlet. We are just talking about at the outlet. Okay. Inner surface. Inner surface at the outlet. So here, if this is my outlet, this is my outlet. So inner surface temperature. Okay. Outlet. Okay. This seventy degree. What is the local convective heat transfer coefficient at the outlet? So T S is known here. This is given. Yes. Okay. So local convective heat transfer will be what? So what is the local convective heat transfer coefficient at the outlet? Okay. So it will be Q is equals to. Now we come to this formula. Okay. Q is equals to H A delta T. Right. I will not put a bar here H H because we are talking local here local average. not average okay so q is equals to h a delta t okay now delta t is what we have ts ts and ts and the outlet the outlet because we are talking local not mean uh, not average okay so t s minus t mean outlet okay you have ts you have ts we have team in outlet okay yes. now we need to find this h right we need to find this h so what we can do is that we can find q by a sorry uh, so so, uh, so we can find what is h will be so h will be Q upon A divided by T S minus T mean outlet, right? Just mathematical manipulation, nothing else. I did it. Okay. So I know T is T. Okay. I know what is Q. What will be A? Surface area. Surface area. That's true. Inner surface area. Hmm? The same, but so without it. So inner surface area will be what? What's the? By D. By D L. So. By D L. By D I L. Just imagine this Q is all the Q which is coming. Okay. This Q is all the Q which is coming, but it is coming to the water through the inner surface. So inner surface of the pipe is pi d inner L. Inner surface of the pipe is pi d inner L. But now, what is L in this case? Sorry. L in this case, because we are talking about local. So, actually, we are talking about local, but this Q is the complete Q we are putting. This Q we found how this multiply by the volume, so that's the complete Q. So we take the complete L. So we take the complete L. So this will be the complete, but this thing will define this. Why it will be the complete? Why? Why? Because why? Because the the the, the Q we are talking about the local, right? But the local heat transfer coefficient will vary with the local temperature. Okay, as far as the Q is concerned, we have to take the Q for the complete pipe. Since we are taking Q for the complete pipe, we calculated the Q for the complete pipe, not for the local. There is no local Q. How can we find local Q? We can only tell find Q based on whatever given, which is the generation rate, rate in terms of watt per volume. So we can find overall Q. So we can find overall Q divided by overall area. Overall Q divided by overall area, so that will be Q dash. Now remember, Q double dash is same 
for local or for the uniform q double dash is q per unit area it is same for the complete or for any local point do you understand this concept or not q double dash is the low for example okay let me say uh, how do I give an example mm, a person weight is a person weight is 10 kg perfect it does not matter what is the person's height if you are giving in terms of kilogram per for example I am 6 feet okay so 6 feet will be 60 so my weight will be 60 10 kg so, so if I am giving you the average then it does not matter what is my actual height because if I have the height I have the total hmm? if I have the height I have the total when you, yes. when you increase your weight will increase the law of the edge? Yeah. Q is equals to H A delta T? Yes. And and so how, how, how do we find the edge? Yeah. We find the edge by using this law, but how does this law come? I know this law. Oh, that's it? H equal, we have Q. We have so we have Q, we have A, we have TS, we have TM, we'll find edge. Then you use that Q. But the thing is that, look, look, the area will depend upon Q, which Q you are using. If you are using a Q at a local point, then the area will be for that local area. If you are using, that's, that's not possible. That's why Q at a single point is not possible. That's why they gave it in for the complete body. But Q over A for a complete body will be the same as Q over A for any point because it is it's per unit, unit per unit area. It does not matter. It will not change if you move from point to point. Are you getting? Yes. This is a pretty difficult concept to explain but you have to visualize, imagine, imagine things. Do you understand it or not? Yes. Why does the S is equal to T S minus T mean out? Why delta S is T S minus T mean out? Why we use mean out? Because we are considering the local condition. Now you are confused on one thing. Let me clear it, clarify it to you. What you are confused in is that we were finding local edge, so we are using the local temperatures. But for Q over A, we are not using the local. Yes. Is it true? Is this is the this is the thing that you are confused in or not? Yes. Right. This is. A, so what 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 point is that Q over A is Q double dash. Q double dash is the same for local and for the complete q double dash will not change from local to the complete yeah yeah that's okay yeah what you're saying is that if you put a here yeah okay so your point your the thing of confusion for you is that we are using temperatures local we are finding H local, why we are using Q upon A for the complete body. Q upon A is Q double dash, heat flux. Heat flux does not change whether you find it for a single point or you find it for the complete body. It will be same. So heat flux, when it is said that the heat flux is, suppose it is said the heat flux is 500. So for heat flux 500 means in the complete body heat flux is 5 also at any point heat flux is 5 okay do you understand this concept or not yes. heat flux does not change with with the size of the body when you say q per meter square you make it independent of the size 
Whatever the size. Whatever the size. Whether you're taking it for a small point for for a local position, whether you're taking it for the complete body, you make it. You made it independent of the size. That is heat flux. Is it clear now or not? So if this point is clear, then you know how to find it. Handy. Clear or not? Still no clear. No problem. Ask again. Here's my question. Why you? Because why, why I use T mean outlet? Because I want the heat, the heat transfer coefficient at the outlet only. I want the heat transfer. I do not want the H bar. I want the, hmm? If it is H bar, if it is H bar, then in that case, I cannot use T mean outlet. If it is H bar, then I have to use Delta T L M log mean temperature difference okay. if it is H bar. But right now I'm not using I'm not I'm not finding average, I'm finding local. So that's why suppose it was asked to find out at the inlet. Suppose it was asked to find out the heat flux at the inlet. So what will be the difference? Heat flux at the inlet will be so instead of using TMO, then I would use TMI. Suppose, suppose it is said that find out the heat flux at the length equals to 1 meter. So if we know what is the T mean at 1 meter, if we know what is the T mean at 1 meter, then we will substitute the value of T mean at that 1 meter, suppose 1 meter. So then it will give you, my, give you the H at 1 meter length. Is it clear? H is local, so temperature differences are local. And Q upon A, it does not matter whether it is local, whether it is for a complete body, it is independent of the size. It's Q upon A per unit area. Okay? So it's independent of the size. So it's for local and overall it's same. Do you understand it or not? Yes, sir. I don't want to rush it with, so that you don't understand. I want to move forward if I know that you do understand. Let's see how, how the solution is done. Solution is done the same way. <laughs> okay, they, they initially they put everything in the formula format and then L, they determined it. And after that, the same, Q S double dash is equals to H upon they came up with this formula Q upon A. Q we determined is this upon area will be pi D I L. So if you substitute it, it will become like this. And substitute all the values and that's it. Do you understand it or not? Yes. Zarani, Hamdi, Khayat, Momin. So one problem is over. Huh? I told you that you will tell me if you want a break. They want a break. They are trying. Yes, they want. Okay. Okay, let's start. Is steam condensing on the outer surface of a thin, thin walled circular tube? So it has done in around. Thin walled circle. Thin means no, inner no. and outer are same. Yeah. It's not important. Steam condensing on the outer surface of a thin walled circular tube of diameter 50 millimeter and length 6 meter maintains a uniform outer surface temperature of 100 degrees centigrade. Water flows through the tube at a rate of 0.25 kg per second and its inlet and outlet temperatures are given. What is the, read the question, what is the average convection, convection coefficient? H dash. H, H, bar. H bar. Associated with the water flow. In this, this time, we do not want the local. Average. We now want the average. Right? First of all, do you understand the problem statement? Yes. We have a pipe and we have a tube 
and at the tube outside steam is condensing okay steam is condensing so you know for condensation heat is rejected so where does the heat of rejection goes it goes it goes through the pipe into the water which is flowing inside the pipe okay so the water temperature inside will rise okay so initially the water temperature is 15 degree and at the outlet water temperature is 57 degree centigrade and the mass flow rate of the water is given the length is given diameter is given we need to find what is the average convection coefficient associated with the water flow do you understand the problem statement or not yes so we need to find what q is equals to h bar a delta t lm log mean temperature difference is it clear so we need to find this h bar now for that if if we know q and if we know a and if we know delta t l m then we can find all these h bar now can we find q energy balance the amount of heat convected is equals to the amount of energy gained by the fluid inside the tube so amount of heat gained by the fluid inside the tube is what what will be the formula for that mc delta t so this q will be m dot cp t mean outlet minus t mean inlet right so for the water inside the tube we know what is the t mean outlet we know what is t mean inlet based on t mean outlet and inlet we will find t mean average based on that t mean average we will find cp because this is water we know what is mass flow rate so we will find what is q is it clear once we know q so now we should know what is a and what is delta t l m what will be a Tell me the formula for it. By d l. Remember which area, because it is the surface area, which through which heat will be transferred. By d l. Okay. So we do we know the diameter? Yes, we know the diameter. We know the length. So we know what is area. Now if we know delta T L M, we can find out what is H bar. Is what is the formula for delta T L M? Delta T L M is equals to delta <coughs> T inlet minus delta T outlet over lin delta T inlet upon delta T outlet. What is delta T inlet? Delta T inlet is T S minus T mean inlet right what is delta t outlet s minus t s minus t mean outlet v not t s v not t mean inlet v not t mean outlet so we know all the things in it so we will find what is delta t l m if we know what is delta t l m we are going to substitute here we will find what is h bar is it clear or not yes doctor c b is given it's not given it's not given. The problem starts from here. The question ends here. So how will you find CP? Yeah. You see, I made a copy of the table for each one of you. We need to see it. Can you push it? I I have I have I have put the book. The tables. The table is. No. No, no. If you have the appendage A and C, separate file. I can make a separate file because it is there. I took it from the book, textbook, which is uploaded. Okay. Open, open both at the same time. Khalas, I will do it. I will put a separate file and give it to you. Okay. So, is it clear? The problem solution here. So we have this delta T L M. We found it, and then 
h is equals to now here sometimes things are done like this do you understand what is done here I do things separately so they do things all in one step okay <laughs> this is book okay so at least you should understand what's happening when I explain it to you I do things separately step by step they, they combine the steps together Interestingly, did we use any formula so far for the correlation from the correlations? Not yet. Not yet. There was no need yet. Okay, <laughs> but we will be using them. <laughs> okay, uh, there, there, there is uh, another formula or you can say a law. The relationship between local and average Nusselt number. Focus the relationship between local and average Nusselt number. If it is a turbulent flow, if it is a turbulent flow for a circular tube, then average Nusselt number is the same as the local Nusselt number if L by D is greater than 60. Hmm? For very long tubes. For very long tubes, average Nusselt number is the same as the local. For short tubes, if L by D is less than 60, then average Nusselt number and local Nusselt number are not the same. So, average Nusselt number divided by the local Nusselt number, this is equals to 1 plus C upon L by D power M, where C is 1 and M is 2 by 3. Okay. They do it like this. There is a reason behind it. This we are we are considering for the case of turbulent flow and circular tube. If it is not a circular tube, maybe a different tube, maybe the C value is different. So it's a generic formula for all the cases. Is it clear? Now this is a very interesting question and you should focus here. A method to generate electric power. Let's see the figure. The question itself is three pages. This is page one, this is page two, this is page three. The question itself is three pages. Okay. Huh? It's a story, not a question. <laughs> okay, next lecture. No. Okay, so we have concentrator tubes this this is the parabolic concentrators okay and uh, uh, we have a fluid which flows through these concentrators so what the idea is that the concentrator takes on the solar energy concentrated on the tube so the tube gets heated okay so, uh, yes no, I don't think you saw any concentrators. You saw flat plate. Yeah, yeah, there were tubes behind the flat plate. There were for cooling, not. Yeah, but there was different. But I don't think so that you saw concentrators there. It's not as But the concentrators are similar to you see uh, the dishes at the top of the building, antenna dishes to get the satellite connection. Yeah. So they're sim similar like this. The dish is, is like a dish form. The concentrators are like, yeah, Parabol in length, Parabol pa parabolic in shape and uh, having a certain length. So anyways, these are the concentrators. The idea is that whatever the solar energy will come, they fall on the concentrator. The concentrator act as a mirror. So it will reflect the light and all the reflection goes to the focal point at the focal point we have the tube the tube gets heated up and it gets really heated up at a very high lines, there is tube inside uh, there is a fluid yes 
So this, these, these lines actually show, the color shows the temperature. So as the, pa the, the fluid passes through this tube over the concentrator, it gets heated up and becomes red here, very hot, okay? So we have a one fluid which is passing through these concentrators, so it's collecting the solar energy. And then this fluid enters into this heat exchanger, exchanges heat with the working fluid for Rankine cycle. This is the Rankine cycle. What is the working fluid for the Rankine cycle? Steam. Steam. Water. Huh? <laughs> okay. So, so it's so Rankine cycle. Uh, where do we need heat in the Rankine cycle? In the boiler. In the boiler. So this heat exchanger is basically a boiler for the Rankine cycle. Okay. So, but on one part it is heating. It is powering the Rankine cycle. On the other part, it is getting the heat from the solar energy. Okay, so two different fluids are here. One fluid is running within the concentrators, within the solar circuit. This is, you can say, this is the solar circuit. This is the power circuit. This is the one which generates power. This is the generate. This is the one which takes in the solar heat. And the two circuits are connected with this heat exchanger. The two fluids do not mix each other but they transfer heat through the heat exchange okay so now we come over to the problem problem statement a method to generate electric power from solar radiation involves concentrating sunlight onto absorber tubes so we concentrate sunlight onto absorber tubes that are placed at the focal point of parabolic reflectors these are the parabolic reflectors they're like parabolic mirror it will reflect all the light onto the focal point. On the focal point, we have the tube, which will get heated up. The absorber tubes carry a liquid concentrator fluid. So this is a different fluid. Obviously, it is not water. It is some different fluid inside. That is heated as it flows through the tubes. After it leaves the concentrating field, the fluid enters a heat exchanger where it transfers thermal energy to the working fluid of the Rankine cycle. Working fluid of the Rankine cycle is the water steam okay the cooled concentrator fluid is returned to the concentrator field after it exists exits the heat exchanger a power plant consists of many concentrators the net effect of a single concentrator tube arrangement may be approximated as one of the creating a constant heating condition at the surface of the tube consider conditions for which a concentrated heat flux of 2000 watt per meter square so the thing is that at the tube we have a constant heat flux the constant heat flux is the solar energy, which is constant, okay, which is falling on the tube, concentrated falling on the tube. And this is how much? This is 2000 watt per meter square. These are realistic values. Even if you have, if, if, you, if you ever happen to go into a concentrating field where solar energy is collected, actually this is the amount of energy which is being collected. This is actually the heat flux. The values might be a little up and down, maybe it's not 20,000, 19,000, 18,000, 22,000, but close to this. These are real values. Assumed to be uniform over the tube surface, heat, a concentrator fluid of density, thermal conductivity, specific heat and viscosity. So the fluid inside that, that circuit, the solar circuit, is not water, it is a different fluid. And since it is different fluid, so its properties are given. Okay, so the properties of density, K, Cp, mu, all these things are given for the fluid inside that circuit. The tube diameter is 70 millimeter and the mass flow rate of, of a single concentrator tube is 2.5 kg per second. What is the concern, if the concentrator fluid enters each tube at 400 degrees centigrade and exits at 450 <coughs> degrees centigrade, what is the required concentrator length? How much heat is transferred to the concentrator fluid in a single concentrator tube arrangement? So the thing is that it is given that in one of the concentrator tube, it enters at 400 degree and leaves at 450. Okay, it enters at 400, leaves at 450. What should be the length of this concentrator? So it's like a similar problem length we did before. We need the length. We need the length. Similar problem we did before. Maybe we need the length. So, so it enters 
400? At 400 It's already heated. No. And it leaves at 450. Okay. So this 50 is really this, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is important. How is this at 400? How does it how does it becomes 400 degrees centigrade? The the, there, is, there is a first initial period of charging this circuit. So, or the, so initially the circuit will get charged to the required temperature level and then the heat exchanger will start working. So initially the fluid is just running and the circuit is getting charged. Cir circuit getting charged means getting to the required temperature level for which after which the heat exchanger will start operating. Can, what is 400? <laughs> from the sun as well? Oh, okay, okay. I thought it is from, it is already in No, no, no. This, everything, all the energy getting from the sun. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, so the thing is that the first part of the problem is very simple. Uh, amount of energy gained by the solar energy is equals to the amount of energy heated uh, or, or, the, or the amount of energy rays of the concentrator fluid. Okay, so what is the amount of energy gain by solar energy? 20,000. 20,000 watt per meter square. Okay, and uh, what is the amount of energy uh, what is the amount of energy uh, raised of the concentrator fluid inside? So amount of energy raised of the concentrator fluid will be So we know what is the inlet temperature of the water, of not water, for the fluid of the concentrator fluid. We know what is the outlet temperature, okay? So it is given that the fluid enters at 400, leaves at 450, okay? So we know what is T mean outlet, we know what is T mean inlet. Do we know the mass flow rate? Yes. The mass flow rate was given. 2.5 kg per second. So we know the mass flow rate. Do we know CP? Yes. Hmm? How can we find it? It is given. At what temperature? So it is independent of the temperature. If you say we can find it, then you will go into the tables. And when you go into the table, you will find it for water. But here, within the solar circuit, there is no water. So it is concentrator fluid, which is not known which what, what is the fluid. So that's why the properties are given. So use that property. Consider these properties are given at the mean temperature. And you can change it to water. And we set for the property. Hmm? And that's enough. You can't change the, that fluid to water. No, no, I won't do that. Not like uh, that level? No. <laughs> is it clear? So, so we, we use the CP value here. So we know what is Q. Q. Okay. So if we know what is Q, then this, this Q is the amount of heat gained by the water. Yes. Gained by the concentrator fluid. Q is the amount of energy gained by the concentrator fluid. But how this energy is gained? By solar energy. And solar energy, how much it is falling? 20,000 20, watt per meter square. Okay. So Q double dash is known, which is equals to Q upon area. Right? The energy is falling on the tube. So it is the surface area of the tube which is getting the energy. So what is the surface area of the tube? Pi DL. Pi DL. So this is pi DL. Hmm? We know D, we know Q double dash, this is given, 20,000 watt per meter square. We know what is Q, so we can find what is L. Is it clear? Is there anything which is not clear? It's 
So we know what is the heat flux. Okay. We know what is the amount of energy gained by the fluid. So heat flux is equal to energy gained over the area across which heat is being added. So you see here, they put everything in one step. They write everything in one step, but it's the same thing. M dot CP delta T is equals to Q double dash into pi DL. Q double dash into pi DL. Okay, so they find out what is the length. So now you know what is the length of the concentrator the, uh, reflector, concentrating reflector. So that was the first part that we know. Now, not even complete first part. How much heat is transferred to the concentrator fluid in a single concentrator tube? Okay, this we already did. This is the Q. How much heat is transferred? How much, what? How much heat is transferred to the concentrator fluid in a single concentrator tube arrangement? This is the skew. Actually, we did this first, this step first, then we found out what is L. Same. It's same. So this thing, or you can do it, find either either using this or using this, it's up to you. Because this skew is the same as this Q. Okay. Okay. So here they found it using this Q. They use yeah. use this form. What is the surface temperature of the tube at the exit of concentrator? Now what is the surface temperature of the tube at the exit of concentrator? At the exit. So we need to know what is the surface temperature at the exit. So how do you think you will be able to find it? Correlations? Still we don't need correlations. <laughs> Q is equals to H A delta T, right? Yes. Q is equals to H A delta T. Now, uh, yeah, now we will have to use correlation because H is not given, okay? So, So we can write here Q is equals to H A. At the exit, it will be what? T S T S minus T M out. Right? Or I can write here Q upon A, which is Q double dash. Okay. Q double dash I already know. Yes. Okay. Q double dash is equals to H T S minus T M O. We know what is TMO, we know what is Q double dash. If we know what is H, we can, we can find what is TS. If we know what is H, we can find what is TS. Now for, for finding H, now first what we need to do is that we need to... Yes. We need to check the Prandtl number, we need to check the Reynolds number, then to see if it is laminar, if it is turbulent, and see which one we have to follow. Now, in this problem, what do we have? Because which, which fluid we are dealing with? It is a concentrator fluid, okay? So, what properties do we have for it? We have rho, k, cp, mu, these four properties we know. So, Prandtl number we can find out. Prandtl number is? Rho something double mu. Yes. So the formula for Prandtl number is? Uh, uh, ki uh, kinematic viscosity over thermal diffusivity, which is equal to mu Cp upon K. Mu is given, Cp is given, K is given. So if you put all the values, the Prandtl number comes out to be? 4.98. Prandtl number was rho. Prandtl number, Prandtl number was Prandtl number was this. Prandtl number was V upon alpha. 
Is there another formula? No. Now, V is mu upon rho. Mm -hmm. And alpha is rho CP upon, uh, sorry, uh, alpha was what? K upon rho CP, I think. K upon rho CP. Right? So rho, rho will cancel. So it's mu CP upon, mu CP upon K. Is it clear? Yes. So now Prandtl number comes out to be what? 4.98. Okay. And uh, Reynolds number. For Reynolds number, we know the formula for Reynolds number is 4m dot upon pi d mu. Do you remember how this formula came? We in our last lecture we derived it for a circular tube. Yes. Okay. By using the hydraulic diameter and mass flow rate. So we know what is mass flow rate, we know what is diameter, we know what is the viscosity, substitute all the values. So the Reynolds number is 3.03 into 10 to the power 5. So do you think it is turbulent or it is laminar? Based on the Reynolds number. So what is the criteria? If the Reynolds number is greater than 10,000, it is turbulent. Less than 2300 laminar. Yes. So is it greater than 10,000? Yes. 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 Turbulent. turbulent. Uh, Fully turbulent. That's yes. for sure. Okay. Which turbulent? Hmm? Okay, now let's go to the formula sheet. Here we have yes. the formulas, right? Yes. So for turbulent, these are the formulas. Okay, so which of the formula we are going to use? Reynolds number is 3.03 times power 5. And Prandtl number is 4.98. First one. Because it is in this range, so we'll use the first one. Is it clear? So now we are going to use the first one. Step by step, you have to focus. Okay. So now we are going to use first one. Now we decided, Majdi. Now we decided that it will be this formula that we will use. Yes. Right. Okay. So, anyways, eight point six. We will use the T mean temperature. But in any case, we use the temperatures for the fluid which was given. And we consider that as T mean. Okay. Which was, which was a temperature? So we know the fluid inlet temperature 400, outlet temperature 450. So assume that those properties were given at the mean now temperature 425. Now we're going to find the H. Hmm? Now we have the lesson. Okay, tell me what will be the power N here? Read here, n equals to 0.4 if Ts greater than Tm, n equals to 0.3 if Ts less than Tm. What do you think in our case? Ts greater than Tm or Ts less than Tm? Ts is greater than Tm, sure. Because it is heated, yes. we are heating the fluid, right? So surface temperature of the tube should be greater than the... So 0.4. So it will be 0.4. Is it clear? We already know Prandtl number, we already know Reynolds number. We now know what is N, so we'll find what is Nusselt number. Yes. Okay? Nothing about H. So Nusselt number is related to H. Is equals to H D upon yeah. Sorry, H D upon K. Sorry. Nusselt number is H D upon K. You remember what is Nusselt number? Nusselt number is a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. When we started this about Nusselt number in chapter number 6, we discussed that what is Nusselt number? Is it a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient? Yes. Hmm? So now we know what is K, we know what is D, we know what is Nusselt number, we'll find out what is H. If we know what is H, we're going to substitute the H here, you will find out what is the surface temperature.
It is just plug and play, but it's not that simple. If you, if you don't practice, you're going to suffer. I'm telling you. So when you are heating the fluid, so the surface temperature <laughs> is it like you he said. <laughs> Oh, really? Yes, now we can <laughs> so when you are heating the fluid, when you are heating the fluid, the temperature of the tube should be greater than the fluid. So Ts must be greater than the fluid, otherwise heat will not go. What? Yeah, what this? Yeah, you have to do. You have to do. It. You have to solve the puzzle. Okay. Do you understand? Uh, do you understand how did we find the Nusselt number? And once we find the Nusselt number, we find H. Once we know H, we will find what is T S, right? So. So once we know H, we will find in the formula, we will find what is the TS. The problem is not yet finished. They ask about something else. Something else? Yes. A little confusing. Yes. What's your question? <laughs> Fine? Okay. The problem is not finished here. Now, <laughs> let's talk about part 3. We are done with part 1. We are done with part 2. Let's talk about part 3. The maximum and minimum temperature of the entire power plant are the exit temperature of the concentrator fluid and the ambient temperature. The uh, temperature difference is 20 degree occurs across the heat exchanger and a second temperature difference of 20 degree exists across the condenser where T infinity is 20 degree. Determine the minimum number of concentrators each of length L needed to generate power 20 megawatt of electric power. You do, you do not understand anything, right? Victor, you, you, know, you know what is the uh, statement? <laughs> you can focus. Victor, we reached the, uh, the last line, we forgot the first line. Okay, Maybe let me. It's easy. Okay, let me explain you. What, what they're saying is that, in the question, what is this asked is that uh, we need to find how many concentrators do we need? Mm -hmm. as, as simple. <coughs> We have one concentrator. <coughs> the whole part one and part two was the analysis for one concentrator. But there could be many concentrators, right? We need to know how many concentrators, how many minimum number of concentrators do we need in order to generate a power of 20, 20 megawatt. This is a power plant, right? So we have to find uh, per, uh, one concentrator, the power of one so Okay, let me tell you. Let me tell you. I'm smiling for some reason. Okay, so you see, <laughs> what is asked is that how many minimum number of concentrators needed, right? How many minimum number of concentrators needed to generate this much output? How many minimum number of concentrators needed to generate this much? This is the output. The solar energy that we are getting and the power, the heating which is done, that is the input. So we have efficiency. Yeah. But when we when we say that what is the minimum number, look, 
when we say what is the minimum number of concentrators needed that means minimum number of concentrator need is only when uh, is will be when the when the efficiency is maximum okay. okay so what is the maximum possible efficiency 199 carnot efficiency is the maximum possible efficiency remember for the rankine cycle for the rankine cycle carnot efficiency is the maximum possible efficient efficiency you remember that yes okay so that's the ideal one so now we move back to thermodynamics <laughs> so efficiency of the rankine cycle is in terms of temperature 1 minus TL upon TH. You remember? Yes. 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 Yeah, you remember that, right? After you write. So, so TL was what? Low temperature. Yeah. So in this case, what they say is that the minimum temperature is of the ambient air. Ambient air. You reject heat from the condenser. That's the minimum temperature. But we are not going to use TL or TH, we are going to use TLI, THI, chapter 1, do you remember? <laughs> huh? <laughs> we are not going to use TL and TH, we are going to use TLI and THI. Approximately because we have... Uh, so there is a temperature difference exists, 20 degree here and 20 degree here. So TL, ambient temperature is 20. 20. <coughs> Okay, so but this will be 20 degree higher than 20. Because look, the condenser reject heat to the ambient. Ambient is 20. But the temperature at which the condenser is rejecting is not 20. Yes. If it is also 20, heat cannot flow. So, the, so it's more than 20. How much more? 20 degree more. You are getting the point? So this is chap this is this is now chapter number one integrating with this chapter. You remember chapter number one last topic? Yes. Integrating with this chapter. Here. So it will be what? You remember for in thermodynamics, now we have to use Kelvin here. Yes. You remember in thermodynamics, we have to use Kelvin here. So it was 20 degrees, so 20 plus 273, that's the Kelvin for ambient. Plus. Plus, two seven, plus 20. 40 plus. 20. Okay. And similarly, TH is the maximum, post, maximum temperature. 450. 450, right? But we have a temperature difference here as well. Okay, and that temperature difference is 20 degree. Okay. What does it mean is that 450 is achieved here, but the point when this heat is provided to the Rankine cycle is not here, is here in the so heat exchange. There so there is a temperature difference of 20 degree. 20 degree, so minus. So, yes. 20 degree less. Yes, so 20 it's degree. So, so basically it is 450 plus 273 minus 20. Minus 20. Why yeah, plus 20 minus 20? You have to go back to chapter number one. No, no, I mean from the back questions. <laughs> First of all, this is a Y plus 3 plus 20 minus 20. That's chapter number 1. Oh, Oh, we add here? This is chapter number one, last topic. We have to go back there. Okay. Chapter one, yes. <laughs> chapter one, last topic. When we discuss how the second law of entropy is linked with the heat and mass transfer. 
the second law of thermodynamics is okay. linked. <laughs> Sorry, say second law of heat transfer linked with heat and mass transfer. Yes, I remember the exchange. There is two surfaces. Exactly, exactly. And let um, okay, twenty plus and y. Just right now, I think that this is correct because I have to go back there and I will spend fifteen more, twenty more minutes just explaining that thing to you, right? Okay, so <laughs> now we know. Now we know what is the efficiency. Good. Yes. What is the maximum possible efficiency? So maximum possible efficiency means we need minimum number of concentrators. Okay. So efficiency is basically output over input. We have the input and the efficiency. We have the output if we want to generate twenty megawatt. We have the output if you want, if needed to generate 20 megawatt of electric power. We have the output, we have the efficiency, we know what, what will be the input. Now we know the input of one concentrator divided by the overall, so, so this input divided by the input of, divided by the output. energy gained by one concentrator, we will get the number of concentrators. This is the overall input required. The, the, uh, the divide by one input will get the number of concentrators required. Okay, so so that is thirty six point one megawatt, and from one concentrator we already determined that from one concentrator we need point three two four megawatt. We we get point three four two four megawatt. So thirty six point one divided by point three two four it's about one hundred and eleven. <coughs> So there need to be 111 concentrators all connected in series, also all connected in parallel in order to get this much amount, this much amount of power. So this was, was a very interesting problem because it connected so many things. Chapter one, Chapter one thermodynamics, correlations. correlations, energy balance. <laughs> so that was one question and we are done with it. Do you have any, uh, is there anything that you don't understand except the one that was part of chapter number one? I cannot go back there right now. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> question. Are they going to be a story like this? Maybe bigger. No. <laughs>